Hi. Hello everyone. Hi. This is um, EIE Nigeria. Enough is enough Nigeria's um, call of duty during the time that we are all on lockdown. I was with you yesterday. My name is Tolu Dokwe Adelaru Balogu. I'm a journalist, a freelance writer, um, head of presentations for a new uh, Pan-African station located here in Lagos. I've been doing radio and TV, and I've been um, doing a number of things with Enough is Enough over the years now, I think for more than a decade, even though I'm very sure I don't look that old. But anyway, this is part two of a conversation we had yesterday. And yesterday I had Kate Henshaw, award-winning actress and activist, join me, as well as Titilola Vivor Adeniyi. Um, she's the coordinator of the Lagos State Domestic and Sexual Violence Response Team. And they were both my guests as we talked about COVID-19 and domestic violence. Now, a comment that um, Titi Lola made yesterday has led to a part two of this conversation. And today we want to look at children, marriages, churches, mosques, and domestic violence. This always tends to be a very heated and controversial conversation. So joining me, I do have a guest. So right before I take over everything, let me invite my guest to join. Um, and he, of course, is going to be sharing his thoughts on the topic. And we also look forward to having your questions and your contributions to this as well. So please don't forget, uh, you can ask questions, you can send in contributions. Um, you can just, you know, let us know what your thoughts are exactly on what we're discussing today. So let's see if we can get praise on so he can join the conversation and we can kick things off. Yeah. I can hear him, but I can't yet see him. Um, thank you to everybody who's joining in. I'm seeing Timmy Michael 22, um, DJ or D John, Alashupo Keyboard Ventures joined as well. Um, I know I've missed a number of people who already joined. Imo Owo, Africa Diaspora, Yemi, um, Adil Yesodik, Official Tosin, Asiwaju, um, Kamal. So Luke K. So a number of you have joined in already. So just waiting to make sure that we get praise in here. Issues um, I see that are going on there. Okay. I think we need to try that again. I hope it's nothing I have that might be caused issues. So let me try to connect with him um, once again. I know everybody has tried. Oh, wow. I think I tried to connect to the wrong person. I give a shout out to all those influencers, social media influencers who have been, you know, giving out content and staying on the grind. All I've wanted to do is just sleep, wake up, eat, do a course or two if I have any to do, um, probably catch up on what's happening on Twitter and also maybe, you know, uh, check out what's happening on Netflix. There's been an extension of Netflix and chill these past few days. Um, also lockdown. What are you guys doing for lockdown? What's been up with you? How have you managed yourselves? I know there's been some conversation about how mental health has also been uh, sort of adapting in this time as well. People having to deal with a lot of anxiety as to what comes next, what the future holds. People having also to deal with uh, job insecurity. There are a lot of companies um, that are facing some very trying times during COVID and of course as well um, right after COVID. So people are not sure when they go back to work, is there going to be a permanent job for them there? Uh, some have been able to transmit or translate to um, to working from home, but is that something that everybody can do? All right, we see, I see that Praise is having some issue joining. So let me try one more time. If I can't get him this time, uh, then I will, um, what will I do, what will I do? I'll cut this and then probably most definitely try again. I do see some people also sending me uh, requests, but I can't take your request right now. There's only one person that we're looking to have join us uh, for now, and that is, of course, uh, Praise for Wuwe. He's also known as the Family Life Therapist. I hope this will be an opportunity for him to join the conversation. I have a lot of questions, um, a lot of questions about 
what religion is really doing in terms of domestic violence and the conversations that need to be had and are we ready to have them not a lot of people are ready to have this conversation that may in some way or not call out their religion or maybe call out um, a religious leader who hasn't really lived up to some of the expectations we have the conversation around that uh, as well so i can hear praise but i cannot see him i know you guys can hear him as well Praise, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you loud and clear. I think um, my network is freezing. I'm trying to um, see if I can get on another network, uh, but I can hear you loud okay, and clear. So, so should I give you a few minutes? Um, I should try yeah. you again in like two minutes? Let's Maybe find out if, if your people can hear me, then we can shoot. Um, they don't necessarily okay. have to see me. Once they can hear me, just ask them if they can hear me. Then um, we can we can show. Okay. All right. So they can hear you. I've seen some people telling me that they can definitely hear you. So let's go ahead. Um. Go, don't forget, please. You can use the hashtag Call of Duty. Also use the hashtag One Person. Um. And this is brought to you by Enough Is Enough Nigeria, a coalition of of people and groups that definitely believe in a better Nigeria, a country where there's more accountability and transparency and responsibility, both on the side of the those who govern us and though and also on the side of we the governed. Um. So getting straight into it today. We're talking about children, marriages, churches, mosques, and domestic violence. So praise for Wowe. Um, he's known as the family life strategist. So praise, tell me a bit about how the lockdown is doing is doing you before we get into the conversation. How's the lockdown been going? Well, it's been interesting. Um, interestingly, my own office moved online September last year. Mm. So we were pretty much prepared. Okay. Um, we have done before the nation lockdown. So we, we are pretty much just working online. Um, so um, I'm enjoying myself. I'm working, uh, and, um, you know, just waiting for federal government or Lagos State government to do what they want to do. But um, I mean, mm -hmm. it's definitely a new season for everyone. And um, if you have been monitoring the state of affairs in the world, I mean, you should have been prepared for this season because I mean, it's uh, been long coming. Um, so I'm surprised that a lot of people are surprised that it's happening, even though we didn't expect COVID-19 to trigger this, but we mm -hmm. knew that this was going to happen. You know, so I'm fine. Okay, good to hear. Um, hopefully the family is also fine. A lot of people have adapted to working from home, having the kids with them basically 24 hours a day, uh, trying to figure out what they're going to eat. Right now, if I have one more person ask me, what are we going to eat? My head might just blow <laughs> up, you know? <laughs> so all those little, little things uh, that become daily... Uh, daily living because of the lockdown. So let me ask you, um, you are a family systems engineering um, or engineer, or you have a family systems engineering certification. Can you explain what that means? What is that? Okay. Um, family systems engineering certification is a new body of knowledge that is um, that seeks to study and understand the way people think and how the engineering of people can affect the kind of family they build and ultimately the world. That every human being, um, you are a victim of, um, well, you are the mercy of the handlers that produced you. So when you see someone behave in a particular way, we tend to blame them and um, label them without finding out how did this person grow up, how was this person raised. To say that the quality of the family will determine the quality of the society. So if we don't like what we see in the society, we need to begin to build a system-driven family system which can ab absolutely predict or I mean, predict what the future will look like. So a lot of families are not intentional. So that's what that body of knowledge is all about. To say that we can build a family system that works where it models or benchmarks what we have in governance right now, where um, you have the family vision, you have your family governance, you have your family economy, you know, all kinds of mm -hmm. systems that is predictable where family is no longer at the mercy of one man's emotions um, and whatever he says is what, what, what drives, you know, no rule, no nothing. He just does whatever he wants to do, you know. So that's what family system engineering is all about. It's a body of knowledge. And right now, um, it's a certification program that has been offered across different countries. Uh, it's interesting that you say that families are basically not intentional. People get married, they have kids, but there's no in intention behind how those kids are raised. Or maybe they just want to continue the things that their parents were doing. If it's not broke, uh, don't fix it. Even though many will tell you that many Nigerians are broken uh, because of how they were raised or because of certain circumstances around um, their upbringing. But we'll get into a bit of that intentional family conversation when we get into the aspects around children but i want to start with marriage um or maybe just religious leaders so yesterday 
when I was having the conversation with um, Titi Lola, she made a statement um, and she said that um, we are discovering that the DSVRT, we have woken up in the last two years. Religious leaders are truly gatekeepers. Religious leaders are truly powerful. Um, she mentioned that there was a domestic violence case that they were attending to, and the lady told them that she's waiting for her pastor to tell her what to do. And it made me basically just start from the very beginning. Why are religious leaders so powerful? Why are they so influential in the individual lives of the people who, I guess I would say, subscribe um, to their teachings? Well, no, don't forget that um, it's psychological and people don't understand this. The most dangerous person to you and to your sanity is the person who speaks to you consistently every day of your life, or at least three times a week. If, and you realize that religious leaders stand on the podium, which means you are not looking at them, you are looking up to them, because they are in an elevated mm. platform, which is so you hear things like, you don't mix pulpits and the pew. So when you begin to look up to someone consistently, and the person is the only one who speaks to you regularly, even though the person is supposed to lead you to God, Human emotion and human psychology will naturally shift from God to the man, wherein the man becomes God instead of being, um, you know, man of God. So what it yeah. means is never forget that we are coming from an idolatry background where before you go to the farm, you need to consult the DBR, the Babalawo, you know. So one thing about religion that people don't understand is religion takes the shape of the culture it meets in every nation. So what we have is cultural Christianity and cultural Islam, which benchmarks what we used to have. So in the absence of the Abalis, in the absence of the Babalawo, what you now have are, um, you know, religious leaders that people look up to and consult who become a medium between the people and God. Now, when you have that situation, then you will need to defer to that person in every area of your life, including matters that the religious leaders may not necessarily understand right? People defer to them. So people want to change career. They believe that the man of God is a seer who, who will know, have understanding about the next sort of career they need to, to take. People want to travel. They believe the man of God, you know, it's a navigator that can check and see that the road is free. Uh, people want to um, get promotion. They, they go and meet the man of God. And, so it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's something that I don't blame the man of God, the man of God. It's something that stems from our upbringing and our background that we have now modeled our religion after, you know, and never forget the majority of Nigerians are very religious. We are either going to church or we're either going to mosque. And in the absence of quality education that promotes thinking and in the presence of um, military government that governs us for a long time and military people now becoming civilians, where our leaders are not servants, where our leaders are gods that we worship, we hate them, but we worship them. So when they are not around, we talk bad about them, but when they show up, we bow down before them, right? So yeah. our people are already messed up mentally that anyone who demonstrates any form of power that looks superior a little bit becomes an object of worship. And that is what is happening. Wherein people are being beaten black and blue, you know, then someone says, endure hardship, you know, as a good yeah. soldier or Christ or something like that, and people have gotten killed that way. But good thing is, we have a brand new generation of new men of God, um, both Islam, I mean, I've worked with them, so I know, who now say, you know what, if someone is beating you, you can actually separate, you know. So the messages are changing, awareness is coming right now, mm -hmm. and for the first time, Nigerians are also learning to think and question things, and which I think I is one of the things COVID-19 COVID has really, really done, that a lot of people are thinking for the first time to say, wait a minute, you know, have I been thinking, why am I behaving the way I'm behaving? You know, uh, and I think it's, it's good for all at the end of the day. And, and you mentioned something that I've had conversations with my friends about. I, I, I grew up in the church. My father is a Baptist pastor. Um, I, we call him Reverend Doctor, you know, so I was born into the Baptist church. And one thing I've realized is that many of us don't understand that salvation is individual. 
that mm. even whatever church you go to, whatever man of God you follow, you're not going to get into heaven on that man's coattails. He's not going to be able to get into heaven. You get into heaven on your own works. You get into heaven yeah. based on your personal relationship with God as it may be. And I think one thing you said is also very interesting, and that's the historic context. When Christianity or Islam came to Nigeria, as you said, uh, cultural Islam and cultural Christianity, it's adapted with the culture here. And people have never really taken personal responsibility. Responsibility mm. has always been that of the Babalawo, the Olori Ebi, the head of the family. It has always been that of the chief or one of the chiefs of the Oba. So there's always been someone else to look for or look to to make those necessary decisions. And when Christianity and Islam came, culturally we sort of just shifted and then we looked at the people at the head of those religions and we gave them the same um, leadership mantle that these individuals had had previously. Now, I say all of that to say now that many people believe that church, churches and mosques and other religions, that they are basically having failed to adequately and efficiently talk about domestic violence. In fact, many people have said that the two major religions have actually um, enabled and concealed domestic violence. Would you go as far as saying that, particularly as a country like Nigeria with um, Islam and Christianity, and of course, uh, we also have the traditionalists, would you go ahead to say that the two major religions, or these two main, let me say main religions, have concealed and enabled domestic violence in our context? Well, um, I'll yes and you know. Um, you see, again, a, a, a religious leader, you know, is coming from a, a he has a worldview, has a personal bias, and is, is there to drive his own agenda. The agenda has to be clear. Nobody loves to lose members, right? So whatever you need to do to keep your members intact, you got to do it, right? So we, I, I can't generalize men of God, uh, both Muslim and Christian, because I've met quite a number. I've met good ones who outrightly find no if you beat your wife, they are going to organize them to beat you, right? So, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I have seen all sorts in my life, um, and I can't take an extreme. But one thing is very clear, that what we've seen over time is Christianity's dependence is based on love and forgiveness, right? So what usually happens is a man beats his wife, the wife goes to report, and what do we do? We never admit that we don't have the confidence to run therapy. Because a lot of Christian organizations are so instead of making some professionals to say, this man, you have a guy issue, come and see a therapist be until you are certified fit to get into marriage, we're not gonna bring you and this woman back together. Right? So what Okay, praise, is, let me praise, praise, let me pause you, let me cut you off and um, restart because I think you're getting to a very interesting point. We need to definitely make sure we hear, but the signal is not very good. So let me cut you off then re add you again and see if we can get a clearer signal. All right? Okay, that's fine. Okay, all right. Okay, guys, please just hold on. I'm going to add um, praise to the conversation. And he's getting to a point that I've had some conversation with friends about as to, um, you know, seeing all religious leaders as actual counselors and therapists. We've seen it with mental illness. Uh, we've seen it with other things. But I think we also need to consider whether or not they can. Um, you know, actually do these things that they need to do for us. So let's see. Hopefully, we'll be able to get him on now. Hopefully, much clearer. Don't forget, you can send in your questions as well if you have them, or you can just put them um, with your thoughts um, on the thread. I'll see them and hopefully be able to get to any of the ones I can. Oh, good. So day to day. Oh, there we go. Much better. Hello, Mr. Praise. Well, I have to switch and I have to switch and divide to another one. So let's see. I mean, I think this is better. Oh, it's yeah, we can see you now, but the um the audio is now a bit in and out. Hopefully, the network will decide to cooperate with us before we go too far into this. Okay, I think it's cleared up. All right, so I was hearing you briefly, and I had asked you about whether or not you thought the two uh, two of the main religions, Islam and Christianity, were actually enabling um, or concealing DV. And you said you would find it difficult to sort of blanket them, paint them all with a brush, because you have met men of God on both sides um, who are good people. But then you started getting to a conversation, I think, about whether or not um, people should even go to counseling at churches, if we, all, if we should see all men of God as counselors and therapists, if I'm getting you right. Uh, can you elaborate yeah. or explain or, or just restate that? So the, the problem is, um, you know, a lot of people who have seen, you know, men of God, they think that science is anti-faith. 
So the 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 challenge, and I'll give you a clear example. So I was having a conversation with a church and um, I was talking about the need to get their people trained, their counselors trained professionally to be able to run um, psychometric tests. And someone stood up in the board and they said to me, you are trying to bring psychology into church, right? Mm -hmm. Our church is Bible-based, is faith. So I asked him, I said, if during praise and worship someone passes out and falls down, you know, and collapses, what are you going to do? They said they will get an ambulance. I asked them why. I said, because it's a medical issue. So I said, why are you bringing medical issue into your church? One thing is, anything that seems to threaten the man, we try to avoid it because it makes them feel incompetent. But you are not all in all. You need to understand that there are people skilled in different areas, which is why I actually think churches must embrace therapy. Where a man begins to beat his wife or the it's not something you can just use Bible or use, well, Bible, I mean, interesting thing is that even there are therapy in the Bible. What people don't know is, for example, if you look at the way Jesus performed his miracle, a guy was blind, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He didn't assume that the guy wants his to be healed, which is what we do in therapy. We need to ask, what exactly do you want? Then we build a model around it. Now, churches mm -hmm. need to embrace professionals because what the man of God feels is, I mean, a lot of them feel is, I am all in all, I, I have absolute control, and you also see them so. So when your wife is beating you, the first point of call cannot be man of God. The first point of call should be the agency the government has set in place, with, equipped with professionals who can help you, right? But what I think needs to happen is, government now needs to begin to um, relate with religious leaders. For example, abroad, as a pastor, there are levels of counseling you cannot do, right? You need to be licensed to do those kind of things. But here, people are experimenting with people's lives. People are, um, you know, in the name of, okay, let's just forgive and forget. Jesus has forgiven us. Just move on. But if you say, oh, we are praying, we've done deliverance way, but deliverance cannot remove the anger from them because anger is an emotion. It's a pattern, right? You need to uninstall the self-sabotaging pattern that has been created over time. That takes a lot of time in therapy. You know, but it, because it, some pastors, they don't want to feel an imam, and they don't want to feel incompetent, they administer solutions in an area that they are not skilled at, right? Yes. So what happens is people now, um, they now say, we have prayed for him, we have done deliverance for him, anger has left him till the person now kills somebody, right? Mm -hmm. So I think governments need to work hand in hand with religious leaders right now to say, you know what, maybe there is a training, since religious leaders want to be handling those aspects, there are trainings or certifications that they now need to go through for you to be able to administer that, right? And what that also does is it helps the state to have accurate data about domestic violence issues because a lot yeah. is hidden. I mean, who arrests, for example, if a pastor begins to beat his wife, who will arrest the man of God? Who will arrest him? And there are lots of, you know, religious leaders beating their wives, you know, um, um, violating their spouses, right? That, and, and you see, we even talk about physical violence. There is the emotional violence, right? Yeah. That nobody talks about, right? And that is, you know, leading people to serious depression, but nobody talks about that. And the biggest problem I found in Nigeria is once you have a certain number of congregations, you become above the law. You cannot, even when, if you ask security agents to go and arrest him, they've all first kneel down to receive blessing. So how do you arrest someone you are receiving blessings from? These are the issues that have frustrated many of our work in Nigeria over time when it has to do with domestic violence. But I think mm -hmm. it has to be a handshake between government and religious leaders to say, you know what, we are partners in progress. You guys need to help us and to help us. This, can you nominate counselors or set up a department in your church that will specifically handle these issues, you know, uh, and, and let me shock you. At the root of, because what I do when they bring domestic violence cases to me, is I run a simple psychometry. It's called culture, culture compatibility test. I have realized that at the root of many domestic violence is beliefs system, beliefs misalignment, where, for example, you ask a question in culture compatibility test, there's a simple question that says, a man is superior to a woman. Once the man says yes, and the woman says no, you already know that their beliefs are not aligned. A husband yeah. is superior to his wife. The man, the man says yes, the woman says no. Now, by the thinking of that man, eventually one of the, some of the people that Lagos State Government has sent to me, by the time I engage the man, why, where did you get this belief from that a man is superior to a woman? 
they will say Bible. Where in the Bible? They say okay. Genesis one twenty. Okay, so let let's get into that. I I, I listed at least uh, the three main Bible verses that tend to be the ones that um, a lot of men and even some women as well will will point to. And a lot of people say sometimes it's about not contextualizing the time frame and the people who wrote the Bible uh, taking it out of context. But let's get into that. So you have Ephesians five twenty two through twenty three, which says, "Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the home." is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body and himself as savior. You also have um, Tim first Timothy two, 11 through 12. Let a woman learn in silence with all submissiveness. I permit no woman to teach or have authority over a man. Rather, she's to remain silent. But we could also talk about Paul and his feelings towards women and how people have made this to be God's word rather than Paul's word. Uh, then we also have first Peter three, which comes, it's a chapter that comes after first Peter two, in which there were admonitions to slaves to accept yeah. their masters and even ill treatment. Then First Peter 3 comes, the very first verse, says wives in the same manner. And many people have referred to that manner being the manner in which slaves submit to their slave masters. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your husbands. So if they do not believe, they may be won over. Are these words not plain to the ear? How how can it be misconstrued as anything than what many people over the centuries have construed it to be? Okay, so let's go back to the beginning, which is the one that many, most of the men who come to my office quote, Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us make man in our image. Right? That's mm -hmm. the one they quote. That that's where they believe that man is superior to a woman. And I because say, so continue, continue reading. If you continue reading that place, and you say, and let them. So if he was talking about man male, then it cannot be let them. It must be let him. That word man there is not the word male. The word man there is the word humanity or human beings. Where mm. human, human is expressed in two gender, male of, and female. Which is why the Bible says male or female created Eden. Right? That humanity is man made in God's image expressed in two gender. Now if we go to the ones you have read, those were cultural statements. Right? Mm. Never forget that Paul was Jew right the bible was written within a context right mm -hmm. and when it talks about do not permit a woman to teach it was talking about church administration in a particular city right because those mm -hmm. were just mere letters that paul wrote they were in god's blanket statement right mm -hmm. so exactly understand that but what happens over time is a lot of people don't read the Bible into context. For every biblical verse, I mean, just like you, my father was an Anglican priest, so I grew up in the vicarage, right? So I preached him once, was born into Christianity all my life, 23 years in the vicarage, so I knew in and out of everything, right? Now, people need to understand that you need to separate what happened in a particular city. So when you are reading the Bible, you need to understand the context, the pretext, the post the, the the environment of what you are reading. So people don't understand the environment. So here is the, where I have issues. I went to Enugu State, and I encountered men who believed that they were superior to women, right? Mm -hmm. Then I asked a simple question, because when people have held on to a belief, you don't, uh, you don't fight them, you bypass their yeah. conscious resistance by quoting the question. So what mm -hmm. did I do? I asked all the men who believed that women were superior to, I mean, men were superior to women, mm -hmm. I asked them a question. Mm -hmm. If you have a daughter, and you have trained your daughter to become the best pilot in the world, and she gets mm. a job to buy Air Force One. President Donald Trump has hired her, and her salary is $500,000 every month. And they have now told her that part of her inconvenience, she's permitted to relocate her family, including her father and her mother. And part of the inconvenience allowance they'll be giving you as parents is $10,000 every month for the rest of your life. Now your daughter comes crying to you, and he says, Daddy, I, I don't want to take the job. No, Daddy, I can't take the job. And you say, why? <laughs> say, because the man I want to marry is saying that Thanks. if I take the job, I won't be able to cook for him. I won't be able to uh, babysit. I won't be able I to... Be uh -huh. mm. Now, that, that father, what will you do? You know what all those cultural men did? Holy Ghost fire. Say, I'll cut off his head. That's a useless man. Then I have allowed them to rant. Then I ask a simple question. Is there a possibility that you are keeping someone else's daughter in your house and you have destroyed the entire, you know, estate? What, what people don't understand is when the Bible talks about headship in the family, right? The man, the husband is like the head of state. That headship, yeah, fine. Good to see you. How are you, little? <laughs> now, that headship 
<laughs> that earth is not, is not subjugated. The earth is actually the head of state. The head of state is not the richest, is not the smartest. The head of state mm. is not the most learned. The head of state is simply a, res a man who is served with responsibility to create an enabling environment where everyone's potential can find expression. That's the headship. Yeah. Now, when your definition of headship contradicts that, you are you have become you know a god that must be worshipped, right? That when every husband understands that your wife is not subservient, she's not inferior. When you understand that you are not the husband because you are more intelligent, not because you are richer, not because of anything, you have just been saddled with a responsibility to create a environment. When you understand that, you will no longer feel the need to slap a woman, beat a woman. So it's a function of beliefs. At the root of mm. domestic violence is our belief system. If you get into bosses, you will see the way conductors treat women, say, I have your type at home. What does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean? Right? That the moment you see a human being, opposite sex, and you conclude that you are superior to her without engaging the content and her competence, something, in fact, right now, I tell you, it's one of the symptoms of mental illness. Something is fundamentally wrong with you. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the value we are placing ourselves is what must determine who is ahead, who is below. But I even think it's team-based relationship. When we understand that, unfortunately, error, the carriers of truth are also the biggest carriers of error. Error is taught on various religious platforms consistently on Fridays and on Sundays. These things are perpetuated. I have seen a teaching where it says your husband is your Lord. You know, you, you call him master. I have seen those kind of teachings at the highest level. And I cringe. And I see people, you know, spring that revelation. And I'm wondering who censors what is being taught on our pulpit. And that goes for Islam as well. I have heard someone say that, you know, um, the only book permits you that after you have corrected, your wife corrected that she's not listening. The only book permits you to beat her. And I'm like, excuse, excuse me, does this move make sense to you as a person? You know, so fundamentally until we begin to work on the belief system and until we begin to hold the custodians of our mind which are basically religious leaders and teachers into uh, accountability to now say hey you cannot teach this unfortunately um here is where the problem is in the okay. orthodox, orthodox setup sorry let me just finish it in the orthodox setup before you become a pastor you need to go through the seminary Right mm -hmm. in the Pentecostal mm -hmm. setup, you only need to have a dream, and somebody speaks to you yeah. in that dream, and you are going to yes. CAC to go and register. Once that system, any system whose entry system is porous, will endanger human being, and I think that's the biggest mm -hmm. problem we have right now. It's very interesting you say that, and again, as someone who grew up in what is more of a orthodox or a traditional religion. <laughs> There's a lot of things that you're saying that resonates with me, especially towards the end. But you did mention the Quran, and I do want to note that um, I'm neither one of us. I, I don't want to say anything that would be wrong, but I did do the research, and it says in verse 434 of the Quran, um, and that's the verse that many people believe gives husbands the right to strike their wives, that if you admonish her and she doesn't hear, you stay away from her sexually, and then the third thing you can do is to strike her lightly. Now, even in doing research of this, I saw that there was a lot of debate on particularly what that verse means, that there are different translations of it. Again, we talk about the contextual issue around when it was written, who wrote it, why it was written, yeah. the same thing we're talking about with the Bible. And then, of course, the different... Um, I guess I would say that, uh, just the same way we have denominations, the different belief systems within Islam also sort of... Um, they also look at it differently. Then there's the juris, uh, juris, jurisprudence issue as well, because women can actually get some form of support from their husbands as well. They can lay complaints if the husband is violent with them. So a lot of people say that verse actually contradicts the entirety of how Islam sees women. But that's a conversation that will not be for us to have. But I did want to put it out there. I looked at it, we brought it up, and it's something that is also part of this conversation. I want to, I want to quote something. So in my research... There was a study by the Lancet Journal in 2015, and they analyzed data from 66, um, 66 surveys across 44 countries, about 500,000 women. And what they found was this, that the greatest predicator of partner violence, which is domestic violence, intimate partner violence, was environments that support male control. 
especially norms related to male authority over female behavior. Now, this sounds like Nigeria. It sounds like many uh, typical African countries. And earlier you said a change is coming. But where is that change going to meet the traditional way of doing things, the traditional way of seeing men and women's roles? There are great conversations in the West right now about gender roles, about not trying to force children into those roles at early on and allowing them to be who they are. Not many African countries are having those conversations, especially as it pertains to the influence of religious and traditional leaders. So where, where do we see ourselves? How are we moving forward when we still have belief systems, as you said, that see men, whether the husband, the father, even in some cases, the younger brother, have the authority over a female simply because of gender? Um, you see, the problem must start with redefinition of concept. If we don't have a uniform definition of man, male, mm. female, husband, wife, once those concepts have not been properly and universally defined, it will become a subject to cultural interpretation, which is what mm. has happened over time. But what I say to women carefully is this. And this is where I think women are failing, right? The custodians of the future are the boys and girls in your hand. What are you doing with them? In nonviolent revolution, nonviolent revolution says that the opposition must not see you coming. So you have boys and girls. I mean, as I said, the last time I checked in Africa, a lot of the women are the ones raising children. So how are you raising these children? So when I was getting married, my mother had put me in the kitchen. So I, I, I was coming into marriage not for someone to come and cook for me, right? Then my son, my son is about 13, is about 12 now, right? My son was born. He did not know that women were the ones who cook or women do anything, right? Because we have changed a lot of narratives and we need to change narrative. A man who sweep his house must never expect his wife to say thank you. So he believes that he's helping his wife. Your wife is not the cleaner. You can help the cleaner. If you have the cleaner clean, you can say thank you. But I have seen men who say things like, uh, I don't help my wife because last time I cleaned, she didn't say thank you. And I ask, when you were single and you were cleaning your room, who was saying thank you to you? You are not helping your wife. You are keeping your family clean. You need to understand mm -hmm. these things. Now, when my son was born, he met me washing my plates. He met me cooking. He met me doing all of these things. So my son did not know. He was not aware that there are things like gender roles in the family until he got to school. Social studies textbook, primary three, which yeah. says daddy's job is to go to work, mommy's job is to stay at home and cook for the family. And that became a major issue in his school. Now, so you can see how the educational system is even conditioning, um, you know, this stereotyping. Unfortunately, there are research that has been brought into Nigeria over time that we still promote, which is no longer relevant. For example, there's a concept of men are logical, women are emotional. The major difference between men and women. Now, truth mm. is, when that research was done, it was in the era where men went to war, women stayed at home. So you needed logic. So all the men surveyed in that era naturally came out as logical. Women stayed at home. All the women that they surveyed naturally came out as emotional. Now, if you redo that same um, whatever right now, you will realize that you will find emotional, um, emotional men, mm -hmm. logical women. Because unknown yeah. to people, every human being has got emotion and logic. The one you pay attention to is the one that becomes mostly elevated. As a CEO, as a woman, you, don't, you need logic to fire an underperforming star. So where did we get that from? We had stereotyping like the first need of a man is respect. The first need of a woman is love. Is there any man who doesn't want to be loved? Is there any woman who doesn't want to be respected? These are bust, I mean, these are bubbles that we need to bust. And we now need to get to the point where what we need to do, we may not be able to change anything in this um, generation, but we can mm -hmm. take responsibility for the next new generation. Let me say this carefully. It was a study I did two years ago. Do, are you aware? that the 25 worst countries to live in on this planet are countries that practice gender inequality. The yes. 25 worst countries to live in. The 25 best countries to live in are countries that practice gender equality. That if you want to understand humanity, go into the world of children. When you see children play, children don't talk about I am male, I am female. They just want to play their play. 
They don't talk about superiority, inferiority. No wonder Jesus said, except you become like a child, you can't enter the kingdom. Right? All a child cares about is play. And that's what adults must care about. Right? So the mothers of the mothers we have right now must put their boys in the kitchen to understand that human being cooking is a means to an end. The end is eating. Human beings eat, human beings should cook. So that in the future, he doesn't begin to beat his wife and begin to say, uh, a woman must be able to cook. No, human beings must be able to cook. Human beings must be able to clean the family. Human beings must be able to do some of these things. But I think we have been pushing very hard. We're training people and we are helping people build what looks like a structured family system right now, a systems based, you know, but there's a little, I mean, that we can't do so much until we collaborate with religious leaders and for them to begin to see these things and say, if we drive this conversation, then a man will not see a woman as inferior. He will see a woman as the feminine expression of you. And the woman will no. see the man as the masculine expression of herself. And what that does is it brings a team based relationship where we all support one another to get the best out of ourselves. Okay, so I want to say there are a few things I want to say, even though this, I'm the one interviewing you. Um, number one, when you talked about um, the 25 countries of the worst inequality in the world, when I have these conversations, I need to emphasize to people all the time that if we want Nigeria and the African continent to do better, we must bring more women to the table. Female yeah. CEOs tend to have, they tend to raise more money in the long run and tend to run their businesses better in the long run. If women can't get to those levels, companies cannot make some of the money they need to make. Even in fact, countries cannot make some of the money they need to make. We need to take female health and education very seriously so that we can break those ceilings, women can contribute more, and then of course, human development index will rise and countries' nominal GDPs will also rise. If we continue to lock women out, we will not get to where we're going. That's number one. Number two, you also talked about the fact that women raise the children. Yes, we do. Um, it is changing. There are more stay-at-home fathers these days. There are more men actively involved. But traditionally, it has been the responsibility of women to raise children. And that was also one of the points that women are, that was used to keep women in marriages, that the success of a marriage and the success of a family is all down to the woman. But in mm. saying that, we also have to recognize how those systems have been put in place because of men, because of patriarchy. So I, I don't want us to make a statement like that without also putting a context to it. There's a reason why women have been, were the ones traditionally raising the children. So let, I also want to encapsulate that. Then you talk as well about the, the children, raising children, gender roles or not. I think the world has done very well with female empowerment and the girl child. But in recent times, I've been having more conversations with people. And as you said, I think we are actually leaving boy children behind. Because if we're raising girls to be smarter, to be more educated, more independent, to want to be engineers, to want to be um, astrophysicists and be into space, if you're not raising young boys that will be able to match them, you're asking them to still marry the kind of traditional men that some of their fathers were. And as you said yeah. earlier, in terms of cultural connection and, and having some cultural similarities, that's also already like marriages that are going to have difficulty. We've raised the standard for the girls, then how do we raise the standard for the boys? Okay, um, so here is the issue. Our world, I don't know, maybe it's intentional. It looks to me like there's an agenda, right, to consistently create imbalance to give rise to a future um, problem that they will also position to solve. Because what we have done over time is, it used to be a man's world, so which means we promoted the male child above the female child. But now every funding available is girl empowerment, female empowerment. This female that we're empowering, they are going to marry disempowered men in the future, which will also create another imbalance. So maybe in another 40 years, we'll not be talking about male empowerment, male empowerment. And the problem seems very easy. Why can't we empower the child, irrespective of gender, right? So we tend to go to every extreme at every point in time, thereby creating an imbalance in the future. It looks to me like there's an agenda somewhere where if we solve this problem once and for all, what will some people begin, begin to do later in life? You know, because what, and that's the scariest part of it, a lot of the boys, I mean, if I tell you what's going on in the life of the boy ch um, child right now, it's very scary for me, um, you know, because the girls have been empowered, the girls have been empowered, but what kind of, Men are this boy is going to be in the future, you know, because the moment they become over empowered, the students get married. When they get married to disempowered men, argument is going to ensue. It ensue in very 
guy will take out his anger, will become what we call gender violence or domestic violence. So I think we need to strike a balance and say, okay, the child has a problem. Let us create a solution that is all encompassing, wherein let us raise the girl. I mean, I love the concept of he for she, she for he. Let the boys stand for the girls. Let the girls stand for the boys. That's how you create a balanced world, which is why we always promote a team-based relationship. That the moment you begin to talk about superiority, we can survive without superiority or inferiority, right? If we are all working together towards something, I mean, it's like a football team. You are, your wife is the goalkeeper. Are the striker, but they have dribbled the white. The ball is going to score in your goal. Do you say because you are not the goalkeeper, you won't kick the ball out? When they score, they don't score against your wife, they score against your team. No star player has ever won or lost matches. Teams win and lose matches. Once we understand that concept, then what we'll bring and begin to push is let us empower our future, let us empower both boys and girls. In which, by the time we get into that future, what you have created is a balanced um, future for boys and girls where they collaborate to do greater things instead of creating another imbalance where we're not beginning to talk about boy child empowerment. Okay, so a bit more about the children. So another, because this is about religion, and um, we have a conversation where, especially on Nigerian Twitter, you see it almost on a weekly basis where there's some kind of, I, I hesitate to say competition, but it almost feels like it's a competition of having survived your Nigerian childhood. Um, and last week it was, my, my father put me inside a drum because 100 Naira was missing and left me there. People were sort of basically sharing their war stories of growing up with Nigerian parents. So Proverbs 22, 6, uh, train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You also have Proverbs 13, 24, whoever spares the rod spoils the child. And when we talk about family um, situation. If children are in a domestic violence situation, it is literally just a matter of time before that violence is extended to them as well. Um, so you have situations where many parents, African Nigerian parents, believe that it is a biblical injunction to use, I don't want to say physical violence, to be physical in disciplining their children. But we've also seen that there are people who this thing has left scars. There are Nigerian adults who don't know how to have their own opinion, who don't know how to stand on their own two feet, who don't know how to make emotional connections. And they're going to get married and marry and have children and repeat the same things and almost in a way inflict the same scars that their parents inflicted. So if we're talking about domestic violence, which can also include violence against children, where do we then put this part of the conversation where, again, people feel that there's some sort of scriptural injunction on physically disciplining their children? I don't think there's any physical, any scriptural basis for that um, because the question I ask for people who quote those kind of verses is, you know, people don't understand the Bible that Proverbs is a collection of Jewish things by Solomon, right? So when they make statements like, you know, and I ask a question, can you show me one person in the Bible that they use Koboko or Bilala to, 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 to reset their brain? Right, because if it's in the Bible, I think Bible will show you an example. Solomon was a bado. Did, did you see any place where David beat him? Right, or David's father beating him? Right. So here is the fundamental problem. What the Bible says is, train up a child in the way he should go. Now, question: How do you know the way a child should go when you don't even know the way you should go? You are a parent. You are struggling, but you are training a child, which means the first skill in parenting. It's not even training. The first skill in parenting is observation. Observation to know the way out you go because children will send you signal. I mean, that's one body of research I have done in the last 12 years of my life, right? To say that a child will give you signal and clue to what he wants to do with his life. Then your role is to pick that signal and interpret it adequately. Where we console ourselves and it's an error. You will say that we were disciplined. We were disciplined. We don't understand that the word discipline is the word discipleship. Discipleship does not slap with slapping. Discipleship starts with modeling and instruction and communication before you now correct. Now, correction doesn't have to be with Koboko because you cannot correct an, a behavioral problem with physical um, punishment. If physical punishment can correct behavior, Arm robbers will not be beaten and they will go and rob again, right? If you go to the Norway model, Norway says that they realize that when they arrested a prisoner and they subjected them to corporal punishment, by the time they released them, they went to commit the same offense. So Norway yeah. came out 
when you treat a human being as a human being, they respond with a human behavior. When you treat a human mm. being as an animal, they respond back as an animal. But when you treat a human being as a royalty, they respond back as royalty. So what did Norway do? They changed the prison system into five-star hotel system where every prisoner has a room, every prisoner has a common room, they have TV, they could go to school and blah, blah, blah. And what has happened? They abolished death sentence, abolished life imprisonment, maximum jail time is 22 years. What has happened is crime rate dropped. People left prison to go and become medical doctors. Right? So that yeah. is a model. It's the model of the prodigal son or the lost son, which means when he comes back, you don't change sonship, right? Even if he has messed up himself, he does not stop being a son. The problem of Nigerian parents and African parents is we say they discipline us, we are disciplined. A disciplined generation will produce a disciplined society. If our society is not disciplined, then we were not disciplined, we were domesticated. Domestication and discipline, they look alike, but they are not the same. We were domesticated, which is why we lack confidence. Now, how do you correct a child? You first need to agree on the perceptual code of your child. The perceptual code is a descriptive word that governs your perception and how you see a child. Question is this. How was the British monarchy, how do they raise their children in a way that they don't beat them, yet they more or less turn out right? So it means that your beating is overrated. Now, because some people will come and crucify us, I am not saying don't even beat your child. But here are the questions you need to ask or the parameters by which you can beat a child. One, never beat a child for what you have not taught him. Number two, never beat a child without giving him chance to assimilate what you have taught him. Three, never beat a child when you are going to damage him. Four, never beat a child when you have not agreed, proud to the time the offense is committed, the punitive measure for that offense. Five, mm. never beat a child for when never beat a child when there is another disciplinary measure outside of beating. Right? Six, never beat a child. Um, uh, what's the sixth one? About, about seven of them there about, right? But, uh, I think I'll remember later. But you see, when you have exhausted the seven, right, you can now decide to beat a child. You realize that by the time you exhaust the seven, you won't see the need to beat a child. Because if you say, for example, the perception code of your child is, my child is a royalty, question now is, how do you correct a royalty? If you say, my child is a diplomat, how do you correct diplomats? By the training of diplomats, you cannot beat a diplomat. You negotiate with a diplomat. There are other things you can do to a child that is more painful to him than beating. When we were growing up, our parents beat us. It got to a level, we will go and do it. Say, you know, let him come and beat me, right? So how yeah. do you take your beating correct a behavior? So we talk about slap and slap and slap. Who have we become? We have not become Mazukabad. We have not become inventors. We have not become anything, right? But we brag. We say we have become successful because you are measuring mm -hmm. your prosperity by the cross poverty around you. You have not become anything in the global scheme of things. So can we come down to our level to realize that we do not understand what the scripture is saying? Because let me say this. The Bible says the rod of correction. Now, to a people who have been through slavery, when the Bible talks about the rod of correction, the image they will have is what the slave masters used on them, which was koboku, yes. which was belt, right? But to a generation that have not been through slavery, if you say rod of correction, it can be communication, it can be even the word of God, it can be anything, right? So they can't think koboku, but the black man only thinks koboku because he loves to inflict pain. I can't take you to research. There are research thesis to show that the black man is naturally mean on his wife and his children is there. It's a research work that happened in 1817. I read it and I almost screamed. So we need to understand that there are ways to correct. What you want to do is not to damage the child. You want to correct a behavior. So you are listening to me right now. If I say, sweetheart, you know I love you. Where you are sitting, and I say, you know you are my sweetheart, right? Um, you know, I was just wondering where you are sitting. It's not befitting of my royalty. Why don't you move to this other place? If you sit there, I'll take a selfie with you. And every time you sit there, you know, I, 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 I will just be taking a selfie with you. Now, what I've done is communication, not talking. We were brought up to talk, not to communicate, because communication takes a lot of respect and takes a longer time. Now you will move and move to that place. I have corrected you. Every time you correct a human being and they feel less than themselves or their emotion is damaged, you have inflicted pain on them. So many of us were traumatized Broken people eventually break other people. 
Hurting people hurt others. So many of us need healing from the trauma that our parents subjected us to, which is why we shout. Even when we are praying to God, we are shouting. We say God is omnipresent. God is, he knows all things. He else, but we must still shout as if he's sleeping, you know, because something is fundamentally wrong. I'll give you an example. One of my friends went abroad, you know, and then he's a, he's a pastor of a church, went to a, an all-white church abroad. So they raised a prayer point and he started shouting in the church, right? So he said the usher came to meet him and tapped him and said, sir, are you okay? You know, do you need some coffee? Because the way you are shivering. You know, so as after service, the usher now excused him and said, I think maybe you are just giving your life to Christ. He said, God is your father. You don't need to shout and scream and do all this vibration. He's your father. Our concept of our father, but Amadioa, Shongo, Ogu, you need to shout on them. You need to scream on them, right? And that's the way we now interpret God. And that's the way we now treat our children. So we used to brag that when my father is coming, you know, you run and, and, and behave. Is, is, how can that be a father? Is that not Oshumari? Is that not Shongo or Amadio, right? That a father is coming and you are running away as a child. So we need to redefine fatherhood. We need to redefine parenting. The word parenting is the word um, bring forth, which means a parent is someone who has the capacity to interplay, interface with the potential of a child and bring it to fruition in a way that the child becomes the best version of himself in service to God and humanity. You don't train your child to become your retirement benefit. You train a child yeah. to become the best of himself. Parenting is please, an please. 18 year curriculum. What can, happens for the 19 is your. Hmm. Sorry? Okay, I, I need you to repeat the part about you're not raising your child to be your retirement strategy. I had a Go conversation ahead. on radio about this many years ago. If you hear the insults Nigerians insulted me, that what do I mean? So please, I need you to repeat that for those who may be in their villages or may be somewhere else and they have not heard you. Please repeat. <laughs> your child is not a retirement plan, right? You raise a child to become the best version of himself, right? Mm -hmm. Parenting is an 18-year curriculum. What happens from age 19 is your report card, right? So you need to maximize the 18 years by creating a template that can help your child become the best version of himself, right? Plan your own retirement plan or else you will be bitter. That your child will give to you in your old age is honor. It's not, a, it's not given, yeah. right? So if they don't give to you, you should be excited because you have enough to take care of yourself. But when you have built them as a retirement plan, that's when you go to their house and begin to scatter their new marriage and begin to say you are the new wife, you are the first wife, and all this kind of thing. You please have your own self-esteem. Don't turn your child to the object of your esteem. You must be self-secured, self-sufficient in yourself and understand that the last part of parenting is release. You must be able to release your child having raised him properly to go and live his life. Yeah. All right. So earlier you talked about the fact that you feel that many families are not intentional. And now we're talking about children. A lot of churches will tell you that before they can marry you, you must do marriage counseling. Um, they feel that they must impart some kind of some kind of knowledge on you we went through some counseling and talked about how to deal with in-laws talked about sex talked about finances but my question now is when we see that we need to change how we're raising our children do you think we should start seeing churches and other religious organizations get involved in parenting classes because so many of us will quote Proverbs 22, 6. So many people will quote Proverbs um, 13, 24. But they have not given themselves the tools to adequately raise their children. Should we look to people to provide free parenting classes um, for churches and mosques to also do? You know what? Even if you're getting married, when we hear that you're pregnant, come and do parenting classes as well so that we can start seeing some difference in how we're raising our children. Even if, even though we're not always happy with the teachings that they provide in some of these classes. I, I think that um, can churches, you know, I, I always say to, to people this, the fact that you are a pastor's wife doesn't make you a relationship coach, doesn't make you a certified therapist, right? You are, you, 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 you are, there are some things that is professional. If you are not exposed to that body of knowledge, don't attempt it. You will be teaching error. And this is yes. the thing that I see. Your wife, that you are a pastor's wife, doesn't mean your wife needs to hold the mic. If she has her passion mm -hmm. elsewhere, let her go and put her passion. Right? Don't let her become mama overnight and begin to call herself relationship coach, even when she doesn't have the capacity for it. Right? And that you are a pastor, when it's time to teach about marriage, it doesn't mean you are qualified to teach. Look for your church mm -hmm. member who is certified in that area and let them take responsibilities. Now, what I've seen over time, and I love some churches, um, you know, I've worked with some churches to train their 
counselors and therapists have worked with some people to create curriculum. See, mm -hmm. the power of curriculum is that anybody can deploy it once the curriculum is right. What churches need to do, even marriage counseling is not robust enough. Let me mm. tell you the way I operate. And they say, praise, I have a marital issue. You know I don't listen to them. I will first administer a four-way test called Oyela. We created it through research, right? That four-way test, if I administer the psychometry, I mean the, the questionnaire, and you return it back to me, I will analyze it and I will generate a professional report. It's 96% accurate. Usually mm -hmm. Nigerian men don't like counseling, but I beg their wife to administer the question and not let them feel it. By the time they see their report, they are running to come and meet me. They think I'm a prophet. They say, ah, how did you demystify me like this? How did you, ah, what power are you using? It's pure science. Now, this is a tool that if you administer it on intending couple, you may be able to advise them not to even get married. You may be able to advise okay. them to say, these are the likely challenges that will happen in your relationship. Right? Because okay, praise, your... praise, please, please, praise. Let's pause. So we've done one hour and it's about to cut us off. So let me quickly end this one and restart it again. So please just hold on. I'll contact you back in just a moment. Okay. All right. Hi, so I'm going to get back in touch with um, Praise for where It's been a really interesting conversation. Again, if you have questions, please don't forget um, that you have, you can send in your questions right now um, and let us know. Um, I've seen some comments as well. So please, please send your questions. Let's get back into this conversation so we can wrap up. I don't know. I don't know if EIE will let me come back. I always over, you, you'd be surprised at how quickly time goes and shout out to everybody that's watching um i'm seeing of people as well thank you so much for tuning in we are right okay praise thank you so much so we were talking about the issue around possibly parenting having churches or religious bodies have parenting classes um and you talked about the fact that they're not experts that they should themselves should get experts in and that's where i had to cut you off yeah so i was saying that you know you need to get professionals you see what i don't see churches and religious organizations do is to maximize the professionals that God has sent your way. Churches mm. have, I mean, you have, for example, a say, consultant psychiatrist in your church. What business has you as a pastor talking about mental health problems? You have no business talking depression when you have professionals mm. in your church, right? So what they need to do is to trust the people that God has sent them to help them create a robust, you know, system that works for everyone. So I was talking about psychometry. If I run a psychometry on you, it would show you whether you should get married or you should not get married. You will see it clearly. It's science. You, it will show you the problem you're likely going to have. It will recommend the therapy you need to go through. If you have been through trauma in your past, it will show that you have trauma and you need to go through healing process and all kind of things. Now, these are data-driven intervention that I think religious organizations need to embrace because if with that, we'll be able to help more people. So I agree absolutely with you that they should create i mean i i have seen people use their experience to try to to teach other people your experience is you are totally different so you cannot be insisting that you see what works for you because you are just teaching something that is outdated totally right so i agree churches need to create a robust premarital school and and i drop my heart for just some of those churches that have sent people to us to say praise we don't have the capacity to handle this Please, can you help us professionally to handle this? I, I drop my hat for those churches who have certified, um, certified therapists, you know, in Nigeria right now, who have created a professional unit where people use data to help people. There are a few churches like that in Nigeria that have, that have done that. So I agree that school of parenting must become a mod, right? I agree that, um, you know, premarital classes must become a mod. And for those of us who are professionals as well, we can help people. For example, when COVID started, um, someone had bossed me to say, praise, there's going to be a lot of parenting issue. What can you do? And so what I did was to give a free course on my website. I mean, a course that I would normally charge heavily for. I made it free for people. And handling an erring child, it has helped lots of the testimonies is something else right now. People are calling to say, praise, thank you. This was able to help. You know, what I would have slapped my child for, I just realized I was calm and blah, blah, blah. You know, so for those, I mean, because we are living in Africa, we are no longer qualified to place a price over everything because we can give for free, we need to do it. So churches need to embrace professionals. Let pastors teach Bible. Let them teach prayer. But when it comes to issues of the art, emotional issues, if you have not trained on human emotional management, 
right? You will just be teaching theory, right? And please, one of the things that I've seen also is that pastors need to understand that, or religious leaders need to understand that they are human beings, right? Yes. When you are talking, you don't have to tell us that you have not had argument with your wife. It makes you set a standard that we can't meet because it's not correct, right? That you have not had the first argument, you have not had the first quarrel, you have not had the first, you know, it, made you look, it makes you look like you are not human, right? You are a human being. We understand that you are pro mistakes. You can make mistakes. We understand that you are human and we are willing to forgive. But please let us maximize the use of professionals around us mm -hmm. to help our, at the end of the day, it's not about people worshiping you. It's about people getting help. And we must get to that point that anyone that can give them that help, let us give them access to that person, right? Or, or except we are now saying that our esteem is tied to the number of people following us, which I don't believe is true. Let us set people free by giving them access to solutions. Okay, so this whole conversation, one way or the other, is it has come about to be about families, children, um, marriages, churches, mosques, and uh, domestic violence. So now I have to ask, uh, coming back to the, the statement I said um, that Titi Lola made yesterday, which is about the fact that the realization that DSRV had, DSVRT had, that religious leaders are powerful. And in some instances, we will see um, government used religious or traditional leaders to pass messages. We saw it early on with COVID, um, and there were major bumps in the major bumps in the road with very very influential and prominent um, leaders who did not who, who did not get on board with the messaging. But in terms of domestic violence, we tend to see so few sermons about domestic violence. We tend to see so few sermons that talk about, um, I, I think it is, of course, uh, one of the Bible verses, the, the actual location is not coming to my head, but talks about parents not basically annoying or angering their children. We don't, we don't see those conversations from the pulpit or from the stands, from the people who are there. What we see is wives obey your husband. What we see is children obey your parents so that your days may be long on the earth that God will give you. And in the end, it, it, it continues to reinforce. Um, so you see people will get married after COVID and the preaching will be on how the woman should keep a happy home. And, and if the child is maybe 15 or 16 and there's a family issue and how the child should be grateful for everything that the parents have done. And again, as we said earlier, there's a cultural context to this. So how do we start moving forward? Um, you do family engineering. We've talked about raising boys and raising girls. We've talked about the rod of correction versus... Um, what we see it to be in this new generation and what maybe somebody else may have seen it to be. So where then do we start the movement? And then I'm going to ask about government because government cannot continue to allow certain types of messaging to come from the pulpit, to come from the pedestal, to come from somewhere. We need to get to a point where our curriculum changes to address these things. And also we call religious and traditional leaders to a round table and we let them know that we expect so much more of them. So how then do we move forward? I think that government still has to play a role. And let me tell you where I'm coming from. If you check all the governments in Nigeria, if you check all the ministries in Nigeria, government, you will never find any government that has ministry of family life. So if you take maybe Lagos State, and Lagos State has done very well, right? Mm. What you have are different agents and organs. Now, so if you have a problem with women, you go to Ministry of Women Affairs. If you have a problem with men, where do you go? If you have a problem with your child, you go to Ministry of Youth Transport. Why are we spreading ourselves up and down and there's no alignment? But imagine if we, I mean, if you go to Canada, there's Ministry of Family Affairs. If you go to, Mother, I think, Lesotho, there's Ministry of Family Affairs. If everything is under Ministry of Family Affairs, then we can now create... A, so, for example, Lagos State can now say, this is our vision for a typical Lagosian family. And we now drive everything, to, we drive that agenda with everything we have to come to a place where we are seeing the same thing and everyone is working in the same direction. But where there is no, so you will have a domestic violence team, they are fighting domestic violence team, you have another agency fighting this one. You have, so at the end of the day, different arrowheads, it becomes monstrous, Right. What yeah. we need to do, and government come out and collapse all these organs into a ministry for family affairs that encapsulates everything that is family related. If you do that, then you have got a radical 
no church can or no church or religious organization can operate without a license from God. Right? So you can now put part of the code of conduct that now is I think every Friday did something like that in Kaduna, people shouted, but the guy has done it to say you will need license you can preach. Right, you need to be licensed in some place abroad before you can preach because you can't just preach anything. Terror in tribes by preaching, I mean, excess, excessive preaching from the pulpit. Right, so what needs to happen is if governments create ministry of family, for example, and now create what kind of society do we want to build because the most important nation on earth is your family, your family is the production factor of the society. Once we are clear about the future Lagos we want or the future Nigeria then we will build that um, agenda into the Ministry of Family Affairs, which will now spiral down to all the stakeholders. You will now call all the stakeholders and now say, based on what we want to do, if you are a pastor or you are going to be counseling families, there is a certification program you need to go through. It's basic because we need data. Now, Africa is very low on data, which is why we can't plan. Without data, you can't capture the future, right? So if we say how many divorces happen in Nigeria, we don't know. How many um, domestic violence cases happen? What we are going to quote is not the real figures, right? Mm -hmm. So we now insist that every pastor, every imam, every religious leader, every terrorist, in fact, are you aware that there is no family life industry in Nigeria? The one that we have right now, I literally pioneered it with a few other people. It doesn't exist. There, the only, there is no certification program for family life practitioners. There is no single university in Nigeria or college that is offering a course on family science. So where do people get the knowledge they are using to counsel people from? So what we have is native mm -hmm. intelligence. So I have had to bring family and engineering certification six years ago, and we started certifying people. Right now, we have about 600 certified. No, well, we have about 200 certified. We have associates who are about 400. Right, who are now working in the field, gathering data, understanding, because we are certificate driven, but we are not even competent before we rush out. Everybody wants to counsel. You may damage people by the level of counseling you are doing to them. Right? So what yeah. people do advise you. People want to get married, they do advise you. That's not the right thing to do. So what we need to do is to now say we want to standardize this and ensure that for you to have access to couples, or parenting, you need to take a basic certification program and you must do field work 300 hours or 100 hours. You must face a panel. You must now be certain. Government can take this up. And funny enough, government can even make a lot of money from this, but they are not seeing it. Now, if we do that, then we will present, prevent a lot of damage, a lot of error. Then we will align around an agenda to now say in Lagos State, a man is not superior to a woman, right? And that world must teach. Educational system can now create a curriculum that aligns with that, where, because yeah. the goal of a subject in school, the goal of a subject is threefold. A goal of a subject is to subject you to what you are, the subject you are taking, to begin to think in the line of what you are taking. So imagine my going to school, imagine if I've not taught and he sees in his textbook, daddy goes to work to make money, mommy stays at home to cook. Mm -hmm. So that can mess up his brain. That is the educational system. So when we have a clear agenda of the Lagos or the Nigerian one, we now queue up around it because if you look at it, what has sabotaged many of the things we're trying to do is religion and culture, basically, right? And tradition is so powerful that even the Bible says you make the word of God of no effect by your tradition. Culture is so powerful, but what is culture? Culture is the way of life of a people at every point in time. Which means yeah. culture is promoted. The question you ask about culture is, how has it promoted us? How, what has it produced? Who were the custodians of this culture? Who were the creators of this culture? What was their agenda when they were creating this culture? And what was their exposure level when they were creating this culture? Everywhere I go, I ask men, who taught you about manhood? They say their father. Who taught your father? His father, father. Who taught the grandfather? Great grandfather. Who taught the great... The Father, father, a man in the so too hunting for squirrel with a dang gun. A man who never saw a woman go to work, who never believed that a woman can work, who never believed that a woman can own a conglomerate. That was the man who created the software that has driven everybody. But that reality has changed. But we are still holding on. So when when you read a place in the Bible, 
says, um, treat me as weaker vessel. What I say to people is that the women Peter saw, he did not see a woman bodybuilder. He did not who he gone in his days. Right? But now, you have women boxers. A woman who is a lieutenant colonel in Nigerian army, and her husband, who is a banker, who is the weaker vessel. Is not competence. Vessel is not competence. Your body says science has made a lot of things easy right now, so people can build their body. So that invalidates that conclusion, right? So mm -hmm. what we need to do is to create an a clear agenda about where we want to be, and now create subjects and curriculum around it, and ensure that we certify people. The more certified people, you know, and and I really really pass come to attend our certification program. I'll give an example. There's a pastor, I mean, one of the top pastors in Nigeria, Pastor Emos Fenwa, came to attend the course. Seven days, he was in class. You know what he did? He went back to his church. He went to apologize to members that everything that teaching is culture. He said, I'm so sorry. He said, I just attended a training that opened me up. And you see, he has produced better results. I always respect that man forever for having the humility to admit that what I've Right, I think it's better if we. I think it's only government that can drive it. Government, are, government, government say everybody. We say at home. If we say at home, if government creates a legislation tomorrow to say you can no longer in a television program. Uh -oh. Network, network is misbehaving again. Can you hear me? Well, it's clear with me here. Uh, maybe on okay. your side there. Okay, I, I think we can hear you now. Um, so I also want to ask, because we'll be wrapping up now or wrapping up soon, um, I, for emphasis, because there are people out there, everything we've said has gone like this, phew, or it has gone one ear in and come out the other ear. But particularly as it regards children, we hear many times from women that they're staying because of their children. And as Siti Lola said yesterday, as well as Kate Henshaw, what this happens, what this then does is that it leaves us with a cycle. A child, particularly a male child that is raised seeing his father beat his mother, is more likely to become an abuser in the future. A female child who's raised the same way is more likely to be abused. It increases their incidence, um, th their rates of, be of being in the same type of relationships. It increases them acting out as well. It, it can affect them forming um, intimate relationships and even sexual relationships further on. For a lot of people, that's just English. Because again, a lot of Nigerians will tell you that our parents beat us, we saw this, and we turned out all right. But really... What are, the, what are the ramifications, what are the consequences of exposing our children to domestic violence? Even if the children are not the actual victims, they may be secondary victims, but what's the consequence for those children later on in life um, if this is what they grow up seeing? Okay, can you, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes, yes. And then I can't. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Please go okay, ahead. Okay, so, um, well, let me say we cannot, we cannot make statements that is not based on data to I saw our mother that we turned out well. No, there's no data to back that up that we turned out well. Now, what I must however say is that you don't stay in a, an abusive marriage because of a child. No. You're not going to help a child because what is fatherhood? What is being a husband? The concept of a husband is the word bridegroom. The word bridegroom is a that means the groomer of a bride. It's a job description. If you don't have the capacity to groom your wife and groom your family, you are not a husband. You can just be there as a spouse. So you are just there as a space holder, right? So when we understand that, which is why I love the fact that the agencies of government are put in place to help people, right? That when the man becomes abusive, Lagos State Government plays report. When you report, um, Lola would like 
small um, certified professionals with them, or they will send you to our office or send you to other agencies where we can help people. And we've helped quite a number of people with interventions, right? So you cannot stay there because when your child begins to see your father, this will happen. It's either that boy, it's okay for women to be beaten when they don't fall in line, or the boy may develop um, um, what we call, he may develop hatred, right, for being a husband. Which is why you see, I mean, I have had a lot of clients who are 40 and they are not married, and I'm asking why. Separate, I saw my father beat my mom, and I don't want to beat another. So you can see the trauma. Many of us have been traumatized. We have not recovered from the trauma, but we are carrying on and we are believing that all is well. All is not well. See, the covenant of life is superior to the covenant of marriage. I know religious people will disagree. You need to be alive before you can even talk about marriage. The moment your husband begins to beat you or your wife begins to beat you, that person is inhuman, which means the capacity to be a human being has left him. And what you need to do is separate, right? You need to separate. Once you separate, you will save your children. You will save yourself of the yes. trauma of your children witnessing your death by your, their father. Now, when you do that, right, you are, you, are, you, are, you are setting yourself aside so that you can see be alive. Because when you now talk about reconciliation, if you now come to beg, to now say, come back home, don't even leave. You need to insist there is a flow chart I created that you must follow. Now, you must go through counseling with a problem. And on that day, that he will no longer lay his hands on you. If he's not willing to sign that undertaking, no deal. Right? And which is why we must no longer stigmatize people who are now single parents, who survive domestic violence. We must not, they are heroes. We need to praise them. Because let me tell you, if you are a human being and you are standing on the express road, Google be careful the express you are standing on the express road and the 911 lorry is coming, what do you do? You run away. But you see, human beings try to a good man, a good man or good man sees evil and hides himself. Domestic violence is evil. Bible says hide yourself. He said, but the wicked and the stupid goes hide and is destroyed. That if you stay there, you are capable of being destroyed. So there is nothing called uh, that's not what I just oh. try to see me. And I said, what was the problem? He said to me that his daughter's husband had been beating her, and um, that mm. last time that happened, the lady lost several months pregnancy because the guy threw her against the wall. So I said, wow. why? He said that um, we are afraid of what people will say. I said, what does that mean? He said, because we've had church members in the past whose husbands, spouses were beating them, and we said they should stay. So it would look like hypocrisy. So I said to them, And go and apologize. Take your daughter. Right? Mm. And the lady is still alive today. Right? So it's important for us to understand that the covenant of life is superior to the covenant of marriage or any other covenant. It takes someone that is alive to be remarried and be reconciled. If you are dead, you are gone. Right? And that is given if you stay in an abusive environment. All right, so this has been a very extensive conversation. Um, I know they told you it was going to be one hour, but now we're doing an hour and a half, so I do want to wrap up so I can free you for the evening as well as those who have joined us. Uh, we've been talking about um, children, marriages, churches, and mosques as well, and domestic violence. And we've gone from biblical sp uh, scripture about uh, women submitting to their husbands and husbands being the head of the house and talking about spare not uh, the round so you don't spoil the child. We've also talked about a verse in the Quran as well. But overall, 
in the context again, and I like making things very contextual. These are conversations that are being had abroad. Uh, they're being had in some African countries. Um, the the statistics say one in four, one in five Nigerian women um, has suffered from intimate partner violence. We know what the United Nations um, UNICEF for the uh, Children's Education Fund said recently, not recently, a few years ago in terms of violence that is meted out on the average Nigerian child, about five in 10, six in 10 Nigerian children but before the age of 15 primarily females will suffer some kind of physical or sexual violence and also the for the numbers for the men for the young boys was not good as well so i say all of that at the end to wrap up and ask you to wrap up your thoughts as well we want a better country for ourselves we want better homes for those who choose to get married better marriages better fathers and mothers who raise better children and a generation that doesn't repeat the mistakes that we might make or the mistakes that our parents made, a generation that, that does not that does not make themselves silent so that the pain stays inside and then they end up taking it out on those they love behind closed doors. At the end of the day, churches, marriages, churches, wait, children, marriages, churches, mosques, and domestic violence. What are your final thoughts? Okay, my final thought is that, um, you know, each one must teach one, each one must reach one. Um, we must no longer promote bad behavior, applaud bad behavior, accommodate bad behavior. We need to understand that the moment someone begins to beat someone, it's not a spiritual offense, it's a civil offense, and we must report to the appropriate quarters. And when it now comes to say, I am sorry, let us begin to make use of professionals. I mean, professionalism must be promoted, and I think government needs to spearhead that. I believe that a church should never, a church organization or a mosque organization should never be superior to the constitution of Nigeria. And I think our governments and our governors need to get their hearts in order, right? By putting laws and, and the people in the parliament, they need to put laws in place that will ensure that anyone who is interfacing with people is properly certified so that we can help more people. But above all, we all need to model the right life to our children by ensuring that the life of the girl child is not inferior to the life of the boy child. Let us promote collaboration where if, if the female is strong, the male is strong, we can promote a strong society. That's all it takes. We can no longer, you know, subjugate our women. Let the best of us lead the rest of us, irrespective of the agenda. I think that's where I will stop. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Praise for what we definitely appreciate the time on behalf of Enough is Enough Nigeria. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on the topic and being with us for the past hour and a half. We very much appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Have a nice day and echo the rest of the isolation. Days. Uh, into the coming week, we'll know what has happened. Thank you to everybody who has joined us as well. I'm doing this on behalf of Is Enough is I've been talking for an hour and a half. I'm doing this on behalf of Enough is Enough Nigeria. Don't forget to follow them on all of their social media platforms. Um, let people know what you think about this as well. Use the hashtag call of duty or hashtag one person. You can reshare um, this on IGTV once it comes up. So please do that as well. Don't forget, if you're going out in Lagos, please use your face mask. Um, continue to practice social distancing as well, uh, physical distancing. Don't forget to wash your hands 20 seconds, wash your thumbs, your wrists, everything as necessary and continue to use your hand sanitizer. And if you do not have to be out uh, from May 4th, from the time the lockdown is lifted, please consider not going out um, and continue. Remember, even if you don't get sick, you could take it home to someone you love. You could infect a loved one or, or somebody who has, uh, um, who may be immunocompromised. So please, let's just remember each one of us for each one of us. Have a great day. Have a great evening. My name is Solu Lakwe Adile Ribalogun. Thank you so much, EIE, once again, for giving me this opportunity. And you guys have a fantastic evening. I'll see you next time. Bye.